Okay, uh, so let's look at first of all decoherence and uh, quantum to classical transition. So the standard way we think of a measurement is the following. You have an apparatus and uh, let's say a system state, some system state. Now typically during the measurement process what happens is that uh, Uh, both of them get entangled and then when the final measurement unitary let me call it measurement unitary interaction and then finally when measurement occurs uh, we collapse the apparatus into one of these indices and we get the state let me put these coefficients as well we get the state psi i the reading on the apparatus is this and uh, this is given by the probability that's the bond rule <coughs> so uh, that's typically how uh, measurement is interpreted but if you can look you can immediately see the the issue with such a thing simply because let's say you had a qubit and you also had a a certain detector now the detector and the qubit entangle with each other and you get such a state let's say the detector was another qubit so what happens is you get a state like this which is essentially a bell pair and you perform measurement on this guy now one way to interpret it is it this is the same way if you get one on the detector or the apparatus uh, you will infer that the state of the qubit is 1 with a probability half and similarly for the other outcome but this state is uh, actually essentially rotationally invariant locally so this state can also be written as the eigenstate of the poly x operator so now the measurement yields this state of the detector and then you will infer the qubit to be in state state so this is the state of the detector now <coughs> so as you can see first of all uh, there is an ambiguity ambiguity in what state of or what basis of the detector does the measurement take place is it one zero basis or it's the plus minus basis which basis our experience tells us that uh, when we measure the apparatus when we take a reading from the 
reading from the apparatus we don't see it in a superposition like the pointer let's say we are measuring position we measure position we don't measure a detector that is in superposition of two uh, position eigenstates or superposition of two spin eigenstates so clearly uh, the measurement process will pick one of the bases uh, in the course of measurement. Now clearly one can say, one can ask uh, which basis is it? The other issue is also sort of the interpretation. So the other issue is what happens if we do not even perform the measurement. So remember, so I had the quantum state through some interaction it evolves into an entangled state between the apparatus and the uh, system. So let's say we do not perform this measurement. So then our experience tells us whether or not we look at the meter, something has happened. So whether I toss a coin, head or tail, even if I don't know whether head occurred or tail occurred, I am pretty certain that one of the outcomes has occurred. Let's say I seal it in an envelope and give it to you. You are for sure certain that either it is a head or a tail, it's not a superposition. So, well, our experience tells us that even when not consulting the detector uh, how does one express ignorance about the outcomes uh, from the menu of all available choices. <coughs> So for that purpose, we invoke the density matrix formalism. So essentially what's happening is you have a system, you have an apparatus through interaction. The density matrix corresponding to this guy is uh, you know, it would have all sorts of possibilities. It would have CI square terms like these guys. And then you will have some cross terms. So on and so forth. So these are the diagonal terms and these are the off diagonal terms. So as you can see that the off diagonal terms in general are responsible for quantum interference. 
and this particular density matrix I am calling it Q for obvious reasons it has got quantum interference term this particular density matrix is a superposition involves superposition of uh, various you can say paths or outcomes uh, our classical experience tells us that uh, we do not have such a structure representing our menu of choices what in fact we have is uh, just just the uh, diagonal terms and there are these terms go off to zero so let me call this rho classical which can be interpreted as a valid probability distribution so how does rho quantum become rho classical what is the process I describe a classical menu of my ignorance even before the measurement has taken place. So uh, this points to historically the issues with the quantum mechanics or something called as the measurement problem. Uh, why do we see only one of the outcomes of a quantum measurement. Now, of course, uh, uh, the Copenhagen interpretation says that uh, <coughs> A classical apparatus is needed <coughs> to carry out measurements. So you have some quantum world which is linked to a classical apparatus and you see one outcome. And not only that, uh, why this is classical, you don't see the superposition of outcomes. You, When you measure a particle, you don't measure superposition of position eigenstate. So, no superposition of various outcomes. The... The common experience of uh, where this border is uh, very naively thinking or very tentatively accepted is that uh, uh, anything macroscopic tends to become classical, whereas uh, Quantum mechanics describes systems at a very small scale.
However, with things like superconducting qubits, and uh, the gravity wave detector that border has been pushed the difference between microscopic quantum to macroscopic classical border is pushed and it's not even clear where that exactly the border is the other line of thought is the many worlds interpretation that it essentially says that uh, the universe uh, has several branches <coughs> at each quantum alternative and essentially we witness only one of the branches this is more of a philosophical position. This is the Everett's many world interpretation. Now, essentially, what uh, many world interpretation says is that, uh, well, it claims to do away with the boundary at all. It says that the entire universe is quantum mechanical and uh, the whole universe described by the quantum theory and superpositions may evolve uh, according to the Schrodinger's equation And uh, the universe keeps on developing more branches. So one advantage or we cannot say an advantage but one good feature about this is that uh, the entire universe is quantum mechanical with no border, no artificial border between quantum and classical and there are no classical systems. Uh, classical physics at best is emergent. Unlike the Copenhagen interpretation which said that there is an explicit classical border in your apparatus is uh, classical. So you can see, you can all see that uh, there is at you know, at first it looks there is very little common between the many worlds interpretation and the Copenhagen interpretation, but essentially they both uh, uh, are asking the same question. Uh, why do I only observe only one of the outcomes? Whether it's the classical border, I should say classical artificial border that forces me to observe just one outcome or whether, uh, you know, I'm in only one branch of the several branches of universe. Of course, <coughs> if you believe in uh, people like, uh, I don't know, was it uh, Wigner or Wheeler uh, who essentially said that uh, people invoke also consciousness that I the observer makes a conscious choice or something like that to observe only one branch of the universe so on and so forth but uh, uh, well that's not a great place to do physics uh, and uh, what the theory of decoherence argues 
is that uh, essentially there is a way to come to classical physics from uh, quantum mechanics uh, long before even uh, consciousness comes into place. Decorance that uh, what decorance gives a road map of transition between quantum to classical physics uh, without invoking things like consciousness. It doesn't give all the answers, but uh, it certainly give, uh, gives us uh, some answers and partial answers, so on and so forth. So, I should tell you that I do not think decorance is going to tell us uh, which one branch we are going to see, but at least decorance will help us to get a classical menu of choices from a quantum density matrix. Uh, without invoking any classical border or branches of the universe, so on and so forth. So at least decorrence is a progress in the measurement problem. It won't yet give us something like why the collapse of the wave function happens, but it would ch tell us uh, what are the alternatives we see and why do we see them with what probabilities. So the solution to decorrence, uh, well, so what essentially decorrence is that uh, uh, you introduce a third agent. So there is a system, there is an apparatus with which the system uh, is going to interact and there is always the environment. Quantum systems are never, almost never isolated and there is always an underlying environment witnessing it. So decoherence introduces a third agent between system and apparatus and uh, what does the decorrence accomplishes well first is that it converts a density matrix in a diagonal form so that they can be interpreted as a purely they can be interpreted as a purely classical probability outcomes second it decides what basis whether it's the zero one basis what we saw or the plus minus basis measurement takes place. So that's essentially what uh, uh, decorrence accomplishes and how does it accomplish? Well, the good part is that we don't need to invoke any other assumption, it just comes from the quantum theory. So you have the system, you have the apparatus and you have some environment through interactions you get stuff like this now even system is interacting with the apparatus is interacting with the environment and uh, so you can see that uh, <coughs> this could have so yeah in Actually, here we should put i not equals to j. 
yeah so you have uh, for all ij you will have something like these guys and now when you trace out the environment what you get is assuming that uh, the states of the environment were orthogonal to each other so and then finally when you are going to trace out the apparatus also you are going to get purely eventually classical outcomes with whatever probabilities but essentially this is the point uh, over here you get a particular basis particular basis of the apparatus is decided by the environment apparatus interaction So notice when we were firstly doing or studying measurement, we didn't know in what state does the apparatus collapse, whether it's the eigenstates of the poly x operator plus minus or it's the 0, 1. Our experience told us that uh, we almost never see uh, superposition of states on the apparatus. And why doesn't that happen? That typically because this whole entire process, tracing, interacting with the environment and tracing out the environment picks up a certain preferred basis uh, preferred basis for the apparatus and the uh, coherence also tells us uh, what uh, essentially decides how how are these preferred bases By the way, this preferred basis are also called as pointer states. So these are the states which are the pointers of a meter, for example. So <clears throat> it is the interaction Hamiltonian between the apparatus and the environment <coughs> that decides the preferred basis in some sense uh, what is really happening is that uh, the choice of basis is the eigenstates of an observable O which commutes with this Hamilton. So in other words the observable O is a constant of motion of the environment apparatus uh, uh, Hamiltonian. So in other words you can say that uh, the environment monitors the apparatus and performs a quantum non-demolition measurement on the apparatus. Uh, quantum non-demolition is just a fancy word for in other words in the Schrodinger picture sorry the Heisenberg picture O is a 
constant of motion and the eigenstates of O are the most robust. So, as we can see, the Corinth has helped us answer both the questions how a density matrix converts into a classical density matrix which can be interpreted as a evolution, uh, as a probability distribution and also what are the preferred bases or uh, the O provides O gives the preferred bases or the pointer states of the measurement. Now, as you can see from the definition, first interesting thing is uh, uh, the following, where uh, we traced out the environment to get this. So, in a sense, uh, decoherence is providing us a uh, few questions arises. So, you can see that uh, decoherence provides us with an irreversible loss of information to the environment. So, for example, if you have a stern girlac setup and you have a, uh, an electron taking two paths, uh, it's going Uh, this is the upspin topmost trajectory. This is the downspin, the bottom trajectory. Now, using some other stern girlac experiments, this can be reversed. So, this is reversible. However, if I place a detector somewhere, there are photons here which uh, measure this particular path and fly off. That represents irreversible loss to the environment. So, an interesting question or direction might arise. Uh, the study of decoherence uh, with non Markovian evolution. So, <clears throat> intuitively speaking, uh, we make the Markovian assumption precisely when we assume that the information is forever lost to the environment. Well, the, if the information can juggle back and forth, then how do we study decorrence, issues like decorrence? So, the loss of quantum information and emergence of classicality and connected to non-Markovian evolution. Mm, so, an example, let us consider, I will not go into the details of the derivation, but let us consider a particle with the position x and uh, it uh, 
interacts with the scalar field uh, some scalar field in you know q is the direction direction uh, and the way it interacts is the interaction Hamiltonian is given by let's say this guy so uh, essentially what's really happening is as you can see uh, the operator x would be a natural pointer states that's going to decide the point stresses because this Hamiltonian is going to commute with the uh, the position eigenstates so that's going to be your preferred basis uh, for this sort of a environment interaction uh, so let's just look at the master equation now I don't I'll just hold it off uh, but you can derive this master equation in several ways so this is the density matrix uh, in the position representation so the density matrix is the master equation for the interaction of the system and the systems Hamiltonian with the scalar field is given by you have uh, all these terms So this is by the way the master equation in the high temperature limit. <coughs> so essentially as you can see here let me just define the quantities here gamma is given by neta by 2m where m is the mass of the particle and neta is nothing but epsilon square by 2 which is the uh, strength of our uh, interaction remember the interaction Hamiltonian had an epsilon so this is related to the strength of interaction so uh, kb is the Boltzmann constant t is the temperature so on and so forth so you can notice already three parts to this this is your normal one human evolution uh, from the Schrodinger's equation Uh, the second term this causes dissipation loss of energy and decrease in momentum average momentum Uh, this is related to fluctuations or random kicks this is sort of the Brownian random kicks now just look at this term as you can see what's going to be the its effect on the diagonal terms so the diagonal terms you have x 
very much similar to x prime I remember it's a density matrix so uh, we can neglect it effects on the diagonal terms on the off diagonal terms uh, this is has a huge effect in fact uh, you can see that uh, the effect of uh, on the off diagonal terms they would decay if you just plug in they would decay at the rate uh, this rate <coughs> and uh, that essentially so remember this is a rate so to get uh, the relevant time scale for decorence that turns out to be this is the time scale for decay where uh, lambda t is your uh, the thermal de Broglie wavelength So, for a temperature of 300 Kelvin, mass of 1 gram and a, a separation, let us say the separation is macroscopic, 1 centimeter, uh, this turns out to be 10 to the power of minus 40 So, in other words, the ratio of the time scale of decorence over the natural time scale gamma inverse that turns out to be 10 to the power of minus 40 uh, which is a very very rapid process so even if the relaxation time or gamma inverse which was related to the interaction was uh, a time scale of 10 to the power of 17 seconds the age of the universe uh, the rate of decorence turns out to be 10 to the power of minus 23 seconds which is extremely rapid in fact decorence is one of the decorence time scales are one of the fastest time scales in the universe So, uh, an interesting question can be, of course, for us, uh, <coughs> how do such time scales and analysis change under relaxing Markovian assumptions? Which brings us to the final uh, discussion, a brief chat about uh, quantum Darwinism. So what is quantum Darwinism? It's a, well, in some sense, it's an extension of this uh, Zurex program, extension of Zurex uh, quantum
to classical program along with the to a notion of objective reality of the classical world so we saw that decorence yielded the distributions that could be interpreted as classical probabilities which was related to the diagonal density matrices and the loss of coherence also the pointer states or the preferred basis of the apparatus which was in tune with our experience we do not see the superposition of these bases uh, decided by the system environment coupling so it turns out that uh, well if you believe in these things i mean this is all still a very hot area and the problem of quantum to classical transition is still not settled uh, this notion of an objective reality which emerges for multiple observers so not only there is a preferred basis but uh, suppose we measure a tennis ball all of us measuring as multiple observables or uh, observers or different observers would conclude that the tennis ball is at a particular uh, x y z coordinate so roughly speaking if here is a system all observer so this is observer 1 observer 2 observer 3 observer 4 all of them conclude the all observers conclude the same objective reality <coughs> about let's say the position the system so what does it mean it means that uh, you only need a fraction of photons not only there's a preferred basis but you only need a fraction of photons to get essentially all the information about the system which also means that uh, in some sense the information that surviving is able to make multiple copies in a darwinian sense so it's the in some sense the fittest make several copies of the same information and of course uh, one of the tenets is that there is a massive redundancy in the information content of the environment so this proliferation of 
redundant information is known under an umbrella term of uh, quantum Darwinism and uh, there have been uh, several at least a few few experiments have been done verifying the basics of uh, quantum Darwinism. So, in one of the experiments, uh, a single photon was a system and uh, this is a single photon, one photon with the environment of some handful of photons, uh, you know, a few photons serve as an environment and uh, well, when they investigated the environment photons uh, to read the polarization of uh, the system systems so photons pointer state it turns out in this case was state was its polarization and when they investigated this environment photons uh, uh, pretty much all you can gather about quantum systems or the single photon in this case uh, was available when you monitored this handful of particles. So, a small fraction of environment, in this case a handful of photons, was able to provide a lot of information about the polarization of the observed system, observed photon. So there have been other experiments done uh, so essentially one of the one of the corollaries is that the more photons you measure from the environment it's going to have a diminishing return as uh, essentially there is redundancy in the information uh, Of course, what fraction of photons you need to measure, uh, how much is the redundancy, that would also depend upon the details of uh, what is the interaction strength between the environment and the photons, so on and so forth. Uh, well, another experiment was with the NV centers in diamond, which is another very hot uh, platform to study quantum information. And well, nitrogen essentially has one more electron than carbon, so this excess electron cannot pair up with neighboring carbon atoms. As a result, uh, nitrogen's atoms uh, act as a lone spin with its arrow pointing up or down. So it can be treated as a you know a, a spin system in all its right. And they they did an experiment on Darwinism using some uh, NV center thing, and they were able to uh, observe uh, the redundancy of the information. So NV centers also they were able to capture the redundancy in information 
in the environment so something very you know uh, interesting is happening i do not know the exact mechanisms how this does this redundancy arise so this is in true sense uh, from uh, a system system entangled to a system apparatus then we invoke the environment con convert it into density matrices which can be evolved or which can be interpreted as classical probability distributions and also uh, decoherence gives us a preferred basis and from that preferred basis uh, uh, to getting an objective notion of classicality where multiple observers observe the same information so this is the entire uh, you know quantum to classical program which involves a system connected to an apparatus surrounded by an environment and which has a uh, which decides the pointer basis and uh, redundancy classical objectivity now essentially i don't think what these people have considered is uh, anything to do with markovianity even though their system environment was as small as a few photons i don't think they considered this back and forth slashing of information so what happens to objectivity classicality when we relax all assumptions of markovianity not only that how do we quantify it in an information theoretic sense seems like uh, something interesting to do thank you